Hello class, this is section 7.7 .7, and in this video we are going to discuss the vibrating circular membrane problem. So we start with our usual vibrating membrane problem. But this time we are expressing everything in terms of polar coordinates r and theta. Think of it as a vibrating membrane problem except that rather than being on a rectangle, we are on a circle with radius a. So think of it as trying to predict the movements of a 2D circular trampoline. Remember that the gradient looks a little different when expressed in polar coordinates. So in polar coordinates, the gradient is written down as 1, one over r, the r derivative of r du dr plus 1 over r squared, the second derivative of u respect to t, um, theta, I mean. We also want to impose some boundary conditions. So we have that ua theta t is always zero. So in other words, the height of the trampoline around the boundary is always set to zero. It never changes as time changes or as the angle changes. And we also have these given initial conditions. We know what the starting position and starting height of every point on the trampoline is, and it's given by the functions alpha r theta and beta r theta. Oh, and of course, since we are in polar coordinates, we know that r lies between 0 and a, and that theta lies between minus pi and pi degrees, or radians, rather. We begin, as we did before, by considering product solutions. So let's write u r theta t as f r theta times, say, h t. This initially works the same way as it does in the rectangular vibrating membrane equation. We get h double prime t equals minus lambda c squared h t for the time variable. And for the x, y, and for the f variable, we get Laplacian of f r theta plus lambda f r theta equals zero. So everything initially looks quite the same. The only difference between this case and the rectangular case, of course, is that the gradient is written down differently in polar coordinates. It's written down to look like this. More specifically, if we were to write down f r theta equals, let's call it little f, r times g theta, and plug this into this gradient equation, or this gradient equation here, we would get this expression, because uh, this is exactly how you would write down the gradient of f, r, g theta. And then we have, of course, to add the lambda term, so we have plus lambda, f r theta becomes f r g theta equals zero. So this is basically a rewriting of this equation. We know that this g theta term is a constant with respect to r, and this f r term is a constant with respect to theta, so we can pull them out of the respective derivatives, like so. So we just pull out the g theta from the r derivative here, and we pull out the fr from the g from the theta derivative here, and we can do that. And next, we have to divide both sides by fr g theta, and we end up with this. And next, we can multiply both sides by r squared. This gives you an r term in the numerator rather than the denominator of the first term. Eliminates the r squared term in the denominator of the second term and gives you a lambda r squared in the third term. And then we can separate out into two parts. One side that has r's and one side that has thetas. So we grab the r terms over here. And we move the theta terms on the left hand side. And there's only one theta term over here. And we of course, have to put a minus sign over here. 
But anyway, we have, a con we have a situation where we have an equation. The one side is just a function of r, and the right side is just a function of theta. And since they're equal, they have to both be constant. This is a trick we've seen many, many times already, and that's called a constant mu. And so to recap, we have three equations. One is this first equation, h double prime minus lambda c squared h, let's write it down, the prime equals minus lambda c squared h. And we have the equation given by the g thetas, and that's just going to be one over g theta partial squared g theta for partial theta squared equals minus mu, moving the minus sign to the other side. And lastly, we have this rather more complicated equation, r over fr derivative of r partial fr partial r plus lambda r squared equals to mu. Let us discuss this last equation though a little bit more since this is the first new equation that we have encountered. And let's uh, simplify things a little bit. Let's first multiply both sides by fr. And we, will, we can simplify this equation to become this instead. Derivative of r partial f partial r plus multiplying both sides by f lambda r squared f r minus mu fr equals zero, and this factors, of course, into that instead. Now, we want to write down this equation so that we don't have a lambda dependence. We can, there's a way to write, rewrite the variable so that we don't have the lambdas, so let's do it that way. So let's write down z as square root of lambda r. So in particular, we have z squared equals lambda r squared, but also that partial z, partial r, is equal to root lambda. And this implies that partial, partial r equals root lambda, partial, partial z. So replacing all the r's with z's, and keeping in mind that we have um, also r equals z over square root lambda, we then have r is z over lambda, d dr is going to be root lambda times partial partial z, that's the first two terms, the next term is another z over lambda, root lambda, sorry, and partial f partial r is going to be root lambda partial f partial z, and then we have plus lambda r squared, is going to be equal to z squared minus mu f equals zero. And this is our equation instead, and the lambdas here cancel, and the lambdas there cancel, and we get this equation. Now this is a famous equation known as the Bessel equation, and we will talk in the next videos how to deal with this rather complicated equation.